Hello and thank you for joining me in search of our Huguenot ancestors. Now not everyone is aware of where, where the word Huguenot comes from and I thought I'd start by defining that a little although there's no set answer to this but my favourite two options are that it could be from the German word Eigenhossen which means companion or comrade uh, and the other one which I think is terribly romantic is King Hugo who um, had a tower and Huguenots used to meet at the foot of his tower hence Hugo knows Hugo Tour it's a possible possibility now um, this name was applied to people who abjured the Catholic faith um, for a new form of worship that had been instigated by John Calvin. He wasn't the only one to recommend this new religion, but he was quite and above the most popular one in France. And for a time, the religion was known as Calvinism. It was to become the chosen path of worship for many artisans um, and also in the legal profession, doctors, military, lots of people felt that that was the way they wanted to practice their faith. But of course, not everyone was willing to accept this and the intoleration led to over 30 years of war in France, known as the War of, sort of Religion. These wars only ceased in 1598. They came to an end when Henri IV, King of France, um, brought into law the Edict of Nantes. It's a wonderful document, a very, very clever and diplomatic spin. And my God, we could do with him for Brexit and the, the ongoing issues with the trade deal. There was something for everybody in this edict. And soon life began to settle down. Not, not fully, but th there was some sort of stability there. However, his life was cut short when he was assassinated when his own son, the future Louis XIII, was only a child and his son was brought up strictly in the Catholic faith. The, the French monarchy was predominantly Catholic, always. That was part of their remit, if you like. Henry the Fourth's son, Louis the Thirteenth, was staunch Catholic. He was raised Catholic and he gradually eroded the rights Huguenots had gained through the Edict of Nantes. But his son, Louis the Fourteenth, was to bring about the revocation of this edict in 1685. I won't go into here the full details, but following this, Huguenots had very little rights and their pastors, their vicars, if you like, uh, were forced to leave the country. They had 14 days in which to quit the country, but all other Huguenots, practicing Huguenots, were told it was illegal to leave the country. So from then on then, flight to another land was even more dangerous than it had been before. So, having given you just the briefest of outlines, I will turn now to the subject of tracking down your Huguenot ancestors, which requires, in many cases, a slightly different approach than tracking down your UK ancestors. I would just like to add that throughout the talk, I'm going to add in one or two snippets to give you an idea of some of the broader range of, of trades and professions that Huguenots have made their mark on in this country. And do bear in mind that Huguenots have the epithet in this country of being the most successful refugees this country has ever given shelter to. At the end of the talk, there will be a list of recommended websites to help you get the most from your research. So good luck and let's begin. How do you identify 
a Huguenot ancestor? Well, first of all, dates are very important as the main years of Huguenot arrival was between the 1680s and the 1720s. You may well find evidence of arrivals, Huguenot arrivals and Walloons before this date. Walloons, by the way, were Protestants that came from the Spanish Netherlands to seek shelter here. The Netherlands at that time, Spanish Netherlands, were of course ruled by His Catholic Majesty, Philip II of Spain. And it is worth investigating these earlier arrivals, so don't despair and do give it a try. But do remember that Huguenots, very few came over post those dates I've just quoted any arrivals from France around about the French Revolution of 1789 or just afterwards tended to be predominantly Catholics fleeing both the revolution and the subsequent terror and in particular it was priests that came to these shores. But I have to add there were Huguenots here who put aside the worry about whether they were Catholic or Protestant and were happy to help these later refugees, which I think is highly commendable. Once these Huguenot refugees decided to make their home here, they would often, after a while, apply for denization. Not as good as naturalization, but it was a good option for them at the time. They could pay a fee and they would be subject to alien rates of taxes. They would not be allowed to vote, nor could they hold a civil or a military order, nor could they inherit any land. But it did give some rights to them, and of course it also importantly gave a sense of belonging, a feeling of, I'm going to make my mark here, this is where my life is going to be from now on. There is a site that you can go to, the genealogy site, where you can search for your ancestors amongst the denization records that they hold. Good luck with this. The second clue is usually their name. Although the spelling of French and also Dutch names by a clerk or scribe recording all these arrivals, and at times there was mass arrivals, and it must have been an absolute nightmare. There were people arriving with foreign sounding names. They had strange accents to the locals. The locals were struggling to write all this down. Um, they And also spelling, you have to remember, was not uniform in those days. So the combination of all of this meant frequently names were written down, were recorded, incorrectly. No wonder, it's a wonder we can find any names at all, I, I think, when I consider all these options. Um, but, but also, this carried through into later generations where people perhaps went to get married and the name wasn't written down properly. Uh, these are all things that you must bear in mind when you're researching your, your family tree. Another thing to bear in mind is that at times England and France as ever were at war. One such time would be the Napoleonic Wars and the English were obviously understandably not keen to employ people with foreign sounding names, names that sound as if they come from the country that at the moment is their enemy. So in order for Huguenots to gain employment, they would change their surnames to a more English sounding version. So Monsieur Blanc would become Mr. White, Bois would become Wood, and so on. There is one other thing that you have to bear in mind as well, and that is Huguenot women when they married. As the decades went by, they often married locals with anglicised names and therefore it would hide their Huguenot heritage. So 
you do need to look further back and even if you've got an English name it is still worth tracing. I was lucky recently to meet a person from my Huguenot family. I am descended down the male line and he is descended down the female line. It was the first time we met and I'm delighted to say we have got on really well and we intend to continue to stay in touch and meet up again in the future. Now, I said there was a third clue and there is, which is often the area. As I said earlier, Huguenots came over, many settled in Canterbury, some came on to London, huge numbers actually settled in London, but sometimes they moved on. Sometimes they came back to London. Such is the nature of a refugee diaspora. But there are other areas where Huguenots settled in reasonable sized groups, such as Hampshire, Devon, Somerset, Wiltshire, Glasgow in Scotland and near Edinburgh, and Port Arlington in Ireland. Port Arlington is quite significant and I will come back to that in a few moments. Not all areas have surviving records of Huguenots or even the Walloon populations that settled there, but the Huguenot Society of Great Britain and Ireland does hold surviving registers and these have been published as the Huguenot Society Quarto Journals. If you go to the Huguenot Society website, details of which are at the end of this talk, and you, if you're already a member, you'll know this, but if you're not and you decide to become a member, you will be able to search online some of the Quarto series, which are the genealogical journeys of Huguenot families. There is much useful information on this website to be gleaned in your search. Now, I said about Port Arlington coming into being primarily as a Huguenot settlement. The Huguenot church there, built 1692, kept its records in French until 1816. The town had become home to a large number of Huguenot soldiers who had been pensioned off following Protestant King William III's victory at the Battle of the Boyne. Ironically, William's invasion was given the Pope's blessing, due mainly to Louis XIV's aggressive ambitions in Europe. The church registers have been published, and this is another valuable source of information. I have here a page from one of the registers, which I hope you can see. It actually gives details of a christening of a Catherine Guion. They also have the veterans pension books, which often yield useful information. So it's certainly worth checking out these registers. I would like to just mention though that not all Huguenot arrivals were fleeing persecution. Some were actually invited over and offered contracts. A good example of this is Picardy near Edinburgh in Scotland where a settlement was built for and by Huguenots who had been encouraged to travel from Picardy in northern France, hence the region in Scotland being called Picardy, to live and work there and to teach locals their skills. Now I said earlier I would include two or three of the families of other trades or professions or who had other input into life here uh, and I'm about to do that but before I start, I would just say the Huguenot refugees often arrived with just a few clothes and perhaps some small, precious small items. 
perhaps a tiny Bible which a woman could hide in her hair under her bonnet. But others were able to bring considerable funds with them. One such family was the Hublon family. They were able to flee the Hublon family um, brothers were amongst several Huguenots to become the first subscribers and in some cases directors of the Bank of England. One brother, Sir John Hublon, actually became the first governor of the Bank of England. Another story is how the modern stock exchange was founded. It was based upon John Castang, a Huguenot broker who instigated a twice weekly list course of the stock exchange that eventually evolved into the stock exchange daily official list, which is still the third oldest daily newspaper still in publication. Often Huguenots, because of all they had suffered, were very sympathetic to those less able to help themselves, those less fortunate. And with this thought in mind, the French hospital was founded in 1718 to aid those refugees who were unable to help themselves through perhaps misfortune or ill health. And those who went to the French hospital for help were offered compassion and dignity within. There is a website you can go to for the French hospital where you will be able to find out more. Nearby is the Huguenot Museum. Both of these buildings are based in Rochester in Kent and the Huguenot Museum is the only museum relating solely to Huguenots within the United Kingdom. Again, go to the website. You will find out a wealth of information. There is even a section where you can request the researchers there will help trace your Huguenot ancestors. They are very dedicated and willing staff and it's certainly worth going there as a, as a start perhaps. As I said just now, Huguenots were always, perhaps because of all they had suffered, keen to help each other and we have them to thank for the inception of benevolent societies. They were aware that there would be periods of illness or unemployment and felt they needed to protect themselves and their families against further adversity. Friendly societies had already been established in France as early as the 1580s, but Huguenots readily conveyed the idea to these shores, and a number of present-day friendly societies, such as the Foresters, owe their existence to Huguenots. Many societies had been founded in France, such as the Friendly Benefit Society, which was formerly known as the Society of Parisians. It had been founded in 1687. The Society of Linto, founded in 1708, and the Friendly Society, founded in 1720. These are just a few examples. Often the records of societies will yield precious information about individual Huguenots and their families. Crossing the Channel now for a few minutes, the Society of the History of French Protestantism based in Paris does hold a large number of records. There is also a good online website for this organisation that is helpful in tracing both individuals and families in France. Another website is GinaNet French Ancestors where you can search for a particular name and they will also give advice on regional places of reference. So, where else can you detect a possible ancestor? 
Well, I'm just about to tell you a little story. After the Act of Toleration of 1787, in France, many temples were rebuilt. They had been torn down following the revocation. And it was in the little rebuilt temple in Luneray, northern France, that I found not only some French ancestors of mine, but I also was able to see the document that includes my ancestor's signature to pledge to help rebuild the temple. But before you book a trip to France, there are some more places to visit this side of the channel where you just might find the trail of an ancestor or two. Some examples of those, these would be the Bancroft Road Archives or the Spitalfields Institute. Both are based in East London and both are well worth a visit. Another place to look is the Guild Records. These can be a valuable source of information and given that there were many silk weavers and silversmiths amongst the Huguenots, I would recommend as a start to look at the records of both the Worshipful Company of Weavers and the Goldsmiths Company. But there are of course other guilds which you might like to search out ancestors on, perhaps the Guild of Cloth Workers. Now, when someone undertook an apprenticeship, there would be an indenture drawn up, which is a legal document for an apprenticeship. And it would often give a clue to Huguenot ancestry. The apprenticeship books can be viewed at the National Archives. And I have here a copy of a silk weaver indenture, which I will show you. Here is a silk weaving indenture document for apprentice. Isn't that beautiful? It always thrills me to see this sort of document. I have written a book about the Huguenots. And towards the end of the book, you can locate a list of other Huguenot societies in different parts of the world, which may be useful for you to, to you when tracing your Huguenot ancestors, bearing in mind how far and wide they travelled. They not only went um, to Germany and to the Low Countries, they also went to Russia and to Hungary, to North America, to Canada, to Brazil in South America and even as far as South Africa where you may have heard of Franschhoek which is Dutch for French corner and where world famous wines are still produced today. In case you're interested this is a copy of my book. This is what you'll be looking out for if you want a copy. Now I've mentioned banking other finances. I've mentioned salt weaving and silversmiths. Now I'm going to mention spectacles. People don't always think of, of Huguenots having an input into these, but they did. The Dolland family fled France at the time of the revocation. Originally, John Dolland was a silk weaver in Spitalfields, but he took a different career path following his studies in mathematics, optics and astronomy. John's son Peter learned all he could from his father and opened his first shop in Vine Street, Spitalfields. His father joined him at the shop and their reputation went from strength to strength. In 1927, they teamed up with a Mr. Acheson and so the name Dolland and Acheson was to become a household name. I must just ask at this point if anyone has ever used or owned a thesaurus and if so are you aware that it was a Huguenot who brought this into being? 
Peter Mark Roger was the son of a Genevan pastor and his mother Catherine Romilly fled to England to make their home in Soho. Many Huguenots had put roots down in Soho at one time. Peter had loved to make lists from his early childhood. He was always making lists. But eventually he was to write his famous thesaurus while in his early 70s. And this tome has incredibly remained in continuous print to this day. By the way, he also invented the slide rule, an invention that was to remain an important aid for many until it was overtaken by the calculator. And of course, nowadays, on our electronic gadgets, PCs and tablets, etc., you have a thesaurus in electronic form. So Peter Mark Roger lives on. It would take me a great deal more time than we have here now to list all of the areas that the Huguenots have input their considerable influence into. So do bear in mind there are a wealth of wide-ranging activities and trades and professions that Huguenots have had a considerable input into. Even in modern eras, Huguenots can be found in many walks of life. For example, in the world of entertainment, well-known Huguenots would be Len Goodman. Now, I know Goodman doesn't sound very French, but it only bears out what I've said earlier about an anglicising of name or female descent from Huguenots. Of course, Len is a beloved uh, compare on Strictly Come Dancing, or has been in the past. Others are Sir Laurence Olivia, well-known actor, Eddie Izzard, actor-comedian, or Simon Le Bon, which at least sounds very French, musician. In 2017, in 2017, a special service was held at the Huguenot Church in Soho, where Huguenot descendants gathered together with French citizens who have in recent years come over here to live and work in this country. And they joined together to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation. I'm so pleased I can say that the congregation was religiously a mixed one. The Huguenot Church in Soho is the last remaining Huguenot church in London. It is a beautiful church, not only outside, but within. And it's worth visiting the Huguenot church website again, which will be at the end of this short video for you to go and see. You can actually book a visit online via their website. Finally, I would ask you to seek out the Spitalfields Trust. Their website has a wealth of information and their dedication and hard work helps preserve our Huguenot heritage, especially buildings that are related to Huguenots, as well as offering educational opportunities. When you go to their website, do please sign up for their mailing letter, which will give you notice of many Huguenot orientated activities and events, some of which are free, some of which you will pay for. Annually, they have the Spitalfields Festival in the summer, and at the moment, they are offering online walks and lectures, so it's well worth contacting them. I do hope that you have found this talk of interest to you and I thank you for joining me here. I would also be interested to know how you get on with your Huguenot research. So if you would like to email me and let me know, my email address is hampton, H-A-M-P-T-O-N dot Joyce, J-O-Y-C-E, one four 
at yahoo.com. Do enjoy your journey of seeking out your ancestors. Good luck. Bon chance. And here is the list of websites I was speaking of. If you want further details, again, do please email me. Good luck. Thank you for joining me.